70 million acres of wide open possibilities. Nevada is untouched. A place where the desert comes to life, the ground holds the history, and nature perseveres. He built his childhood home for himself, his mom and dad and his brother. It's a modest three-bedroom, uh, two-bath home, and it had a three-car garage, the original barn. In the heart of Las Vegas, I visit one of its most iconic residences. And, and don't you feel like you're doing something important by taking care of it? Well, you got I, I am. Somebody's got to take care of history. I'm in for a treat at the Hammergrins' home of Nevada history. Well, John, once we get you to the top, it'll be 1,081 feet above Las Vegas. I hope you're ready. You're an evil woman. I'm, I'm convinced. You're just terrible. I'm all about the bucket list, John. <laughs> I'm all about exciting. And then I go up the stratosphere for a thrilling way down. Oh! Pretty spectacular, isn't it? Nevada's like that. I'm John Burke. Join me as I explore the seventh largest state in the nation, here on Outdoor Nevada. The live entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas has seen many artists come and go. Not only did Wayne Newton put down roots here, but his house became a gatekeeper of Las Vegas' most precious show business history. Sherry, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for meeting me out here today. My pleasure. When did this whole estate become born? Uh, Mr. Newton bought the property originally uh, five acres in 1965, and then over the years, he was able to buy more and more acreage and to build everything here on the property. He built his childhood home for himself, his mom and dad, and his brother. It's a modest three-bedroom, uh, two-bath home and it had a three-car garage, the original barn. And then over the years, he was able to design his mansion, which is right behind us. He started designing it and building it in 74. It was completed in 1976, over 8,700 square feet. Now, I know he still visits occasionally, but he doesn't live here today, is that right? That's correct. He lives off property about two miles away. Wayne Newton's Casa de Shenandoah Ranch spreads over 52 acres of land in the heart of the city, showcasing Mr. Las Vegas' mansion, vintage cars, wardrobes, Arabian horses, exotic animals, and a special collection of USO memorabilia. We have a museum that houses his uh, jet, his USO section. It has a lot of memorabilia from Vietnam to present day to the times he's gone to Vietnam, Beirut, Afghanistan, Bosnia, and then Iraq. Near and dear to his heart, isn't it? Yes, it is. It really is. He's done a lot for our troops over the years. And when people come in, they see that collection, it must be emotional. It is. We have a lot of people come in there and actually start tearing up. Yeah. And I could not believe how much he's done for them. From time to time, the Midnight Idol has stepped off the Las Vegas stages to entertain our troops inland and overseas. His dedication goes back to the first grade, when Newton performed for the first time in a USO show. Tell me about the classic cars, because that's what gets my heart going. OK, he has 12 classic cars in there. A lot of them are Bentleys, Rolls Royces. We have a Mercedes. We have an H2 Hummer. Um, we have an um, Essex Terraplane. That was uh, Mr. Newton's very first car when he was uh, 15, 16, actually, and he bought it for uh, $50. And then somebody was able to buy another one for him and refurbish it. And uh, it's quite a classic car. And one that belonged to Lucille Ball? Yes, it was actually her incognito car. Um, she would ride around just like all ladies, like to go shopping, buy shoes, and she couldn't go out anywhere with that bright red hair. So she had to have an incognito car, put her hair in a scarf, sunglasses, and she had a chauffeur, Frank, of 30 years, take her around. The singer of Daddy Don't You Walk So Fast sure likes his rides. The remarkable car collection hasn't stopped me from noticing something else. There's something very touching here, and it's it's a letter from Elvis. Can you yes. tell me about that? When Elvis Presley was here in 1976, it was one of his very last performances at the Las Vegas Hilton. Kind of a sad point in his life, and he went upstairs into his suite and was writing this letter, and it basically says that he feels so alone at night, um, he wish he could sleep, but he probably will not. And he talks about, I have no need for this, and there's a bunch of scribbling, and it says, help me, Lord and he wads it up and throws it away. And then a housekeeper found it the next morning, looks at it and thought it was a cry for help. 
So she gave it to one of his security people, security gave it to Colonel Parker, and then Colonel Parker kept it for many years and then put it up for auction. Mr. Newton bought that, um, that note, and he actually wrote a, a song called The Letter. And if you ever have a chance to hear it or at least read the lyrics, I guarantee it'll bring a tear to your eye. That's a, that's a touching. It is, it's a very touching. Um, we had no idea what kind of a dark spot Elvis was in at that at this point of his life, so. And Wayne wasn't just a fan, I mean, they were they buddies. They were very good friends. Wayne's passion for music could only be compared to his passion for horses. Six generations of Arabian horses have been bred here at Casa de Shenandoah. What is their demeanor? Very kind, soft-hearted, gentle. That's what Mr. Newton breeds for. They're not a high-strung horse at all. Do they know when he's here? Yes, they do. When a mayor's getting ready to have a foal, they will actually call Mr. Newton, give him a 24 hours heads up to let him know that she's about ready to give birth. So he wants to be here on property. He's here about 98% of all births. So when he's here and he's getting the foals ready to come out, he guides the, the fold out of the birthing canal, holds on to her, wipes it down, sings to it, talks to it, and that's called imprinting. So every time Mr. Newton's here on the property coming into the barn, they know he's here, and it's just deafening the sounds of the winning that they do. They that want his attention. That is incredible. It is. It's a How really... do they prepare for being shown? Well, they have a show shave where they get their show makeup on. Whether it's a male or female, they will still shave their faces, and they'll put this, um, it's almost like a Vaseline salve, and sometimes they'll have a glitter in it, and they'll put it over their eyelids, which will make their eyes just sparkle and pop, so it draws attention to them, and so the judges will see them. They also make a funny sound when they're um, out and about. They make this snorting sound, and, you know, first thing you'll do, you'll turn around and say, what is that? And that's what they like having the judges look at that because the judges will look at them for that. And, and they know that. They like that attention. Oh, yes. Oh, they love attention. The more attention you give them, the more they'll perform. Boy, they really are beautiful. Of the 700 foals born here, at least 96 have won championships throughout the country. In 2007, Wayne received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Arabian Horse Breeders Association. Sherry, who is this? His name is Boo. He is our resident capuchin monkey here. He's five and a half years old. His uh, BFF is Honey, it's a one-year-old Chihuahua, because he prefers dogs uh, than uh, monkeys. Other monkeys scare him. Um, he has 97% human DNA, so there's nothing he can't figure out. Well, I'm only 97% human DNA as well, <laughs> so I think we have something in common. He goes home every night with uh, Robin. He gets a bath, he gets his diaper on, he gets his own dinner. He has his own bedroom, he has his own earbuds, and he has his own Netflix uh, remote, and he watches Animal Planet. Was this Wayne Newton's idea to have yes. these exotic mm -hmm. animals? He loves animals, all animals. They love him. There's just something about Mr. Newton that animals just gravitate to him. He just, whether they're a two-legged feather or a four-legged furries, they all love him. Boo shares the exotic animal section with penguins, African crown cranes, ducks, swans, peacocks, some smart parrots, and sweet wallabies. Who are these people? This one, his name is Lucky. Um, it's a Dama or a Bennett wallaby. Um, it comes from New Zealand. The little guy up there on your shoulder, his name is Simon. He's one of our many exotic parrots that we have here. Well, I feel very lucky to be here and to be around you and to get this today. So thank you so much, Sherry, for everything. I really oh, appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm glad you were able to come and take part in our branch here. Thanks, Lucky. Thanks, Simon. Don't Shane. Don't Shane to you. Next time you're driving down Wayne Newton Boulevard, take a detour to Casa de Shenandoah and catch a glimpse of Newton's fascinating life. It's clear that Wayne Newton is very passionate about sharing his gifts from the stage, but he also knows his place in Las Vegas history and culture, and he's willing to share that with anyone who wants to come here to Casa de Shenandoah. Whoever has the most things when he dies wins. <laughs> wins what? Uh, the, the contest forever. <laughs> I didn't know I'm, I was in a contest. Yeah, I'm, well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've already won. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, think, I think we're all fighting for second place now. Yep. Born on a Christmas morning in 1937, Lonnie Hammergren has lived the gift of life to the fullest and collected everything along the way. What if I told you that I have found one of Nevada's most fascinating residents, 
I mean, he has tens of thousands of items in his house that you have to see. He's got a dinosaur, he's got a buffalo, he's got a big chili pepper. He's got the space shuttle in his driveway. And it's all courtesy of Dr. Lonnie Hammergan. A transplant from Harris, Minnesota, this eccentric neurosurgeon found in Las Vegas a home for himself and for everything else he needed to have. I've seen a lot of collections in my days. Yeah. But now I'm getting overwhelmed. You've got, <laughs> now, now you're blowing me away. What is this here? My stage. Of course. Yeah. Every man needs a stage. Of course. Where'd we you have, get it? Well, it's pieces and parts from everywhere. <laughs> because a big showboat was out on the Boulder Highway. And oh that gosh. piece came from the showboat. A lot of the rest of it didn't. It came from different things. But it, the little uh, place there, that was the valet booth, and that's where they parked cars from. So I got that first thing, and then later on, I negotiated and acquired the pieces of the showboat. And then uh, a lot of these, I used the same name, the Hammergan Home of Nevada History. That's a good one, that's yeah. a good one. One of Las Vegas's most famous residents, Hammergren built his first home here in 1969. As the collection grew, he acquired two adjacent properties. In 2017, Lonnie's original home went into foreclosure, forcing him to auction most of his items. But there is still plenty to see. When you buy these things, yeah. do you dicker with people or do you just say, I'm taking it? Oh, both ways. Both ways. Yeah, it depends how bad I want it. Uh huh. If I, if I want it, I'll dicker it until I get it. Yeah. Otherwise, if I say, oh, that's a little too rich for me, then I'll say, You'll move fine. On. Yeah, I said, call me back when your price goes down. And half of the time, the price will go down. I know a lot of this is curiosities, but a lot of this is really cool Nevada history. It is. It? It's Nevada and world history, just like the spacecraft down there. It's a piece of world history. It isn't just Nevada history. And, and don't you feel like you're doing something important by taking care of it? Well, you got I, I am. Somebody's got to take care of history. I live in the here and now. However, I'm looking at the future and say, oh, God, okay, if, if I if I lived 100 years, I'd still want that. Huh. An estimated 10,000 items continue to tell his story. Every year on Nevada Day, Lonnie opens his home of Nevada history for public tours. Doctor, I want to talk about you and, and your relationship to Nevada. How much do you love it? I love it totally, love it all. I noticed that as I'm walking through, there's things about space, but you also have signs about Nevada itself. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that, that's important to you? Oh, yeah, sure. See, I traveled all over Nevada when I was in the office, both the lieutenant governor, when I ran for governor. I, I traveled the whole state. And what did you, I'm interested, what did you learn about the state as you traveled through it? Of how big it was. Yeah. That's an unbelievable part, yeah. From being a NASA flight surgeon to one of Nevada's lieutenant governors, Dr. Hammergren has accumulated experiences in all arenas. The memories of a lifetime well spent continue to pile up in his 1,800 square foot home. I have a question for you. Yeah. You got anything interesting? <laughs> yeah. I got. All kinds of good, fun, interesting things. See, and here's the model then of an Apollo spacecraft. So it all goes together. Oh, here's a car, the car that's telling you about. Okay, look at it. 56. Oh, that Lincoln, I like it. Yeah, uh huh. And that. Russian stuff. And just a big old nasty snake. Here's western butterflies, which I collect now, then. And if you take a look, mushrooms. Mm -hmm. But here are the butterflies I collected when I was a little kid. Got and it. I remember mounting those and collecting you do? those. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I listen to you talk, you don't look back wistfully. You don't, you don't live with a lot of regrets, do you? Not at all, no. Uh, I can't think of really anything I've done that I've regretted. Do you think all this would be here if it wasn't for these butterflies? Nope. No? No. That's how I started, so, 
Yeah, and then I realized as I was along the line, hey, that's sort of fun. You know what? You're fun. You're amazing, and I don't have many regrets, and I certainly don't regret coming here today and talking with you. This has been incredible. I've heard so much about you, and you blew it away in spades. You just took it to another level. You are a super collector on steroids, and I, I just want to say thanks for letting us in today. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. From planes, space shuttles, and roller coasters to a notorious paddle wheel and a sarcophagus with a purpose, Dr. Lonnie's home takes you on an overwhelming ride. You're left wondering about the places he's been, the things he's seen, and the meaning behind every little thing he has kept. This is the type of day that just leaves you breathless. I mean, everybody knows that when you travel the state of Nevada, you see these amazing landscapes. But today was a day when you're reminded that Nevada's best resource is its people and the stories they tell. <laughs> My assignment today is to go to the top of the stratosphere and sample all the rides they got up there. But I warn you, what goes up must come down. Traveling across Nevada, you get to be no stranger to adventure. But those adventures typically keep your feet planted on the ground. Not today. We're venturing to the top of the stratosphere, over 1,000 nerve-wracking feet in the air. Hey, Kim, how are you? John, nice to meet you, and welcome to the Stratosphere Tower Las Vegas. Well, thank you. No other place I'd rather be. How long has the Stratosphere been here? Uh, since April 30th, 1996. Now, I understand you have some attractions here at the top of the Stratosphere. We do. Besides the tower, we have four attractions upstairs and an elevator ride you just have to catch. All right, tell me about the elevator ride. Prepare me. What, am, what are we about to do? We have the world's fastest double-door, double-decker elevators in the world. We're talking 1,800 feet per second, John. They're amazing. You get a ride before you even get to the top. You don't start slow here. We never do here at the Stratosphere. <laughs> Since 1996, the Stratosphere has stood at 1,149 feet as the tallest freestanding observation tower in the U.S. Hey, when you see a mountain, you climb it. When you find the tallest structure in Las Vegas, you rock it to the top. Okay, so to get from where we were to where we're going takes how long? Uh, about 38 seconds up to the top. We're fast. We're very fast. It's a little unnerving because you can feel yourself going up and you're thinking, I gotta come down. When the stratosphere was originally planned in 1989, it was meant to have a thousand foot tall neon sign for the hotel casino below. The original idea would have robbed visitors of a breathtaking view of the strip. I'm feeling it. I'm already, I'm like, all right, where are we? You're currently on 112, uh, which is about 980 feet above Las Vegas. And no, it's not the top, John. It, this is the entrance to Big Shot, and you're already white knuckling it. You're, you're worrying me, John. <laughs> it's so clammy. My hands are just, all right, so where do we go from here? From here, we'll head up to level 113, which is actually where you'll load for the Big Shot ride. and. Well, John, once we get you to the top, it'll be 1,081 feet above Las Vegas. I hope you're ready. You're an evil woman. I'm, I'm convinced. You're just terrible. I'm all about the bucket list, John. <laughs> I'm all about exciting. Tell me about the people that come here. Where are they from? All over the world, John. And I have guests from everywhere. And there's how many? 1.3 million in the year. Well, I didn't come all the way here just to talk. I agree, John. Let's it's get time. some action. Let's do this. <sighs> Visitors coming to the stratosphere will find more than just rides at the top. Enclosed, along with the observation deck, are shops, a lounge, and a five-star restaurant. And for those who are really seeking danger and thrills, there's the wedding chapel. Now, I've driven through Las Vegas a lot, always seen this and thought, never doing it. How did I get here? I am about to be shot up to 1,081 feet. To put that in perspective, I'm looking down on the high-rise casinos. It's bring your fear to work day. The Big Shot is the highest thrill ride in the U.S. and second highest in the world. You haven't felt anticipation until you've listened to that pre-launch countdown, assuming, of course, you can hear it over your own heartbeat. I should be fishing. I'm telling you, I should be fishing or hiking. This isn't my strong suit. But I'm here, giving it a shot, a big shot. Okay. Woo! Oh yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. 
Well, that's a cup of coffee. All right, I'm good. No, I'm not. I'm not good at all. Okay. All right. Uh, so I've got good news. It's official. The world is round. Relentless excitement waits at the top of the stratosphere. My heart has barely stopped pounding from the big shot before the next ride beckons. All right, this one's called the x scream. You know, scream, get it? When this day started, my hair was jet black, I'm telling you. We sit in these cars and apparently we go until night and we just head over the strip. Good times. Oh boy. Oh man. <laughs> Too late to back out now? Oh geez. Oh geez. Oh. oh, this thing moves. I didn't know this thing moved. I thought we were just gonna sit here. All right. All right. At least that's over. No, we're going again. We're going again. We're going again. Ah! Ah! Oh, that's terrifying. That's terrifying. Okay, that's good. I think we made our point, right, folks? Oh, no, no. Okay. So we didn't make our point. It's not getting any easier. No. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay, that's my house. Yeah, that's my house in New York. Okay. That was good. Oh. Oh, okay. That's gotta be it, right? Oh. No, get me off this thing! Get me off this thing! That's my hair. Two down, two to go. The final ride on the top is insanity. Dangling precariously over the strip, it spins riders up to 40 miles per hour. Take nightmare-inducing heights and add spinning. This is not okay. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> that ain't right. Uh, I don't know who created this ride, but they're sick. Right now, there's somebody looking at us going, I'll never do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh geez. geez. Oh man. Oh. Oh. Oh no. Ah, it's getting worse. Oh. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, this is the worst one yet. Yeah, this is the worst, this is the worst one yet. I feel like I'm giving birth. Oh. Oh. I'm going to battle. 866 feet up. This is actually worse than it looks. The best part about this ride is that it's ending. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Seriously. Ah, uh, which way's the bar? Oh, jeez. All right, we're good. Bring us in. That was more intense than any roller coaster I've ever been on by far, by like a thousand. That was, that was terrifying. No, I can't even get out. Hold on. And here's the thing. The busiest time for this ride is about 1.30 at night on a Friday. No, thank you. Ain't doing it. Three rides down, and I'm still alive. But I'm not out of this mess yet. The craziest challenge still lies ahead. I got to get off the stratosphere. I don't think they're going to let me take the elevator. Hi, Kim. I got a progress report. Oh, Wait. update. You ready? I'm ready. Baby, I am three for three. Yeah! Right? Exactly. All right, what's and, next? And they, they were terrifying. Now, you have one more big kahuna for me? The ultimate, sir. <laughs> the sky jump, and here we are. What is the sky jump? Tell me. It's a controlled descent, 45 miles an hour, 866 feet above the strip. Are you ready, John? Are you ever ready? But you know what? I'm not one to back down from a challenge. And I see you challenging me, Kim. I do. I want you to walk the plank, John. I'm walking the plank. This may be the last time I get to say this. You're awesome, and thank you for taking me around today. Anytime, sir. As Leonardo da Vinci said, once you've tasted the sky, you will forever look up. Romantic words that push me on towards that open air precipice. If I don't make it through this, dear viewers, thanks for watching. Let's get this started. Okay, let's do it. It's the first step out. All right. Right here. All right. Ready? All right. I'll let you know when. Three, two, one, Eddie! Woo! Oh, man! Oh, what does it take to get an Emmy? Yeah,
Oh, get over here! Come on, come on, come on, come on. Woo! You know what the best part of this day is? I don't ever have to do that again. <laughs> One last question. Who's next? Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Jaguar Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, inspiring the spirit of adventure with confidence in any terrain or conditions. Information at jlrlv.com or jlrreno.com.